thought the way that you do it is you copy the style. And it's not the style. If we make somebody we're teaching how to paint, to make them paint a tree the way we would paint a tree, in time we wouldn't have a good painter. The, the point isn't that they paint the way we paint. The point is that they paint a good tree. We have over 200 teachers around the world teaching these Walk Through the Bible seminars. They don't look like me. They don't act like me. They don't think like me. And if you attended their seminar, you get the same content base, but it would be wrapped in their personality. Much different. That's the way it's supposed to be. So when you're training somebody and they use more humor than you do, don't tell them, don't do that. If they go into the hospital room and you're, you like to be serious and you like to be, have a low tone of voice and you like to read Psalm 23, and they walk in and say, hey, how you doing? It's great to be here. Hey, you had any chocolate lately? I got some M&Ms. Can you have them? I mean, if that's their personality, let them go and watch and see if it works. And maybe you should copy them. <laughs> Number three, alter equipping according to your students' characteristics and circumstances. Friends, I need to really be honest with you here. Not all people are created by God equal. And we try to equip people as if they were all equal. There's a great quote by Dr. Ward. And he said, The teacher who makes little or no allowance for individual differences in the classroom is an individual who makes little or no difference in the lives of a student. Next. Increase student motivation by relationship, retribution, and reward. I have a whole major section about this in the textbook. If you want to motivate somebody, friends, to do anything, there's only three ways you can do this. Listen carefully. I'll give you the essence of this. How do you, how do you encourage a person to be motivated? Answer, by your relationship with them, by a fear of pain, uh, it could be physical if it's your, ch if your children, if you don't pick up your room, <laughs> wait till dad gets home, poor dad. So dad gets home and eventually there may be pain or it's hope of reward, it's hope of reward, which is the third one. Hey, if, if you're able to pick up your room for five days straight, we'll go out and have a, <laughs> a great time at Dairy Queen or whatever, hope of reward. When you teach and I teach, Use all three. Once I was teaching this class, and Sammy came up to me who was teaching little children. She said, I can't keep little children calm long enough. What should I do? I said, bribe. She said, bribe? What do you mean? I said, make some good chocolate chip cookies. Uh-huh. Then what? Then say, I have in here a chocolate chip cookie, one for everybody in this class. And everybody can have their big, I mean, look at this big chocolate chip, go like this. Mm, isn't this going to be good? Can you taste it in your tummy? And then say, it's going to sit right here on this top of this table. And if you're good until I'm not talk until I'm done with the story, you can have the cookie. How many wants the cookie? Now, what are those kids going to do? <laughs> what are those kids going to do? Tell me. They're going to listen. Next, nail down the basics before developing advanced skill. <clears throat> Don't teach multiplication if you haven't taught addition. Encourage students more frequently during early training. During early training. When somebody's learning a new skill, <laughs> tell them good every time they do anything. Next, reaffirm students' independence of their level of performance, independent of their level of performance. We make a tragedy, my friends, in thinking that you can't reaffirm a person unless they're really good at a skill. I cannot, for instance, sing. I mean, in no way. I remember uh, singing in our church recently, just in a Sunday morning, and I was into it singing, and there was a family in front of us and a... Uh, around a 13, 12-year-old uh, red-haired little girl. And I was singing a song out loud like everybody else. <laughs> she turned around and looked at me and shook her head. <laughs> I remember singing um, for our high school graduation with our whole high school class, You'll Never Walk Alone. 
You just dated yourself, guys. And I remember, that's a moving song when you're a high school senior. We were all singing it. And all of a sudden, this, uh, the little choir director uh, takes his, you, you, Wilkinson, just move your mouth, son. <laughs> Can you imagine how I felt at that moment? You know, so many of us do just that. We affirm people only when they're successful. But do you think that's really God's mindset about that? You know, I, I don't really believe it is. Sometimes, a person who makes a C on a test may have lived up to 98% of their potential. And, and I think we need to affirm that effort. We need to realize that some people do their best, and their best isn't anything above a C. You know, this whole truth came home to me a number of years ago when a young man I'm friends with came to me one day, and he was in tears. He was ready to throw the towel in. He'd been working all semester in this course that he, he just wasn't very good, and he was reaching for a C. And he said to me, I'm, I'm going I'm to quit. It's all over. I can't do anymore. And I said to him, you know, you have a piece of paper. I'd like to show you something that maybe would help. So he went, and he got a pad of paper, and let me show you what we talked about. Let's call his name Dave for the story. I said, Dave, uh, how hard are you trying in this particular class? He says, oh, I'm, I'm trying a lot. And I said, no, give, give me a number, a percentage. Are you trying 50% of what you can? No, no, a lot more than that. So well, how, how, how hard are you trying? He said, I'm trying, oh, 95%. I said, 95%? He said, yeah, almost everything I can do, I'm doing it. I said, okay, that's good. But let's say that, that this represents you right here, all right? And you're given how, how much percent? 95%. Man, I'm alive. 95%. And then he interrupted me. He says, yeah, you know some of the other people in the class? The real brains? I mean, they don't even study the night before. They walk in and they just get an A. I said, no kidding. Does that bother you? He says, yeah, I mean, I do all this work and I can't even get a C minus. So now, Dave, if, if, if this was your potential and you were 95%, we would draw a line all the way up to here. And that, that means you only had that much left over. You could give a little bit more. So that, that's pretty good. And you're earning a C minus, huh? He said, yeah. but my friends, my friends are getting an A. I said, okay. Are they a lot smarter than you? Oh, they're a lot smarter. I said, okay. L let's say then, would they be this much smarter than you? No, more than that. This much? No, more than that. This much? Yeah, that's about right, he said. So I said, okay. What grade are they getting? Oh, they're getting an A or A plus without any work. I said, okay. Now, if this was their potential, how hard do you think that they'd be trying? Well, oh, 10%, he said. 10%? I said, it's more than that. And he said, well, maybe. How, how much really do you think they're trying? He said, well, maybe 40%, maybe at the most 50%. I said, okay. Let's kind of give them a 40%. So their teacher gives them an A plus, and your teacher gives you a C minus. And you feel bad about that, right? He said, yeah, I, I want to quit. I said, you know, Dave, there's two report cards. I said, what? I said, there's two report cards. There's another report card that you don't know about that I want to tell you about. I said, who is the one who decided and set the limit of how smart you are and how smart this man is? Did you have anything to do with your IQ? No, I don't, I don't think so. I said, that's right. So in other words, God said, this is your capacity for math. He said, if God was to look down and say, I've given this young man this level and he's hitting 95%, uh, what grade would you give that if you were God? And 95%. Why? Well, I, I think it just hit him like that. I think he saw it. He said, I think I'd give, I'd give him an A+. Plus. Whoa, dang, that's pretty good. Now, here you are, God, again, and you gave, for some reason, that only heaven will tell, you gave this person all this potential, and they're given 50%. And I could see the gleam in his eye. <laughs> he, he wanted to say, what would you give that young man for a grade? He said, an F. I'd give him an F. I said, would you show any mercy? He said, well, maybe I'd give him a D minus. He said, that's right. Now, Dave, when it's all said and done, you've got to be concerned about these grades, but sometimes you've got to remember that a C- minus to you really is an A+. Well, that young man walked away from that little pad 
and all those little lines saying to himself, all right, I'm ready. You get it? Kind of wraps up Maximizer 7, doesn't it? Remember, friend, always reaffirm students independent of their level of performance. Well, believe it or not, we're nearing the end of the law of equipping. But before we do, I want to share with you a little bit of the heart of walkthrough. It's going to be a little personal because we here at the ministry have been trying for years to practice what we preach. And I want to show you a couple of pictures that mean a whole lot to me because they represent the fruit of practicing the law of equipping over time. This first picture contains the cream of the crop. These are the people that we have handpicked from all across America to teach Walk Through the Bible seminars. It's hard to believe that this year we'll be giving more than 1,400 seminars in 27 countries and 31 languages. And whenever I rub shoulders with our faculty, I always walk away greatly encouraged and inspired. It's men like these who are carrying the Word of God are literally around the world. And it's all because of the law of equipping. There's one other picture I want to show you. This picture down here is only one of many that we could show because it represents just one of the countries that walk through the Bible ministers today. This picture, believe it or not, was taken outside of a restaurant in downtown Singapore. And it's the board of directors and the faculty of WTB Singapore. You know, this is one of the great delights of my heart, that there are faithful men and women around the world who are carrying on the work of Walk Through the Bible. And I want to share with you right now how all this came to pass, because it all began with the law of equipping. And I realized this one night as I was trying to think of a real-life conclusion to the law of equipping. I was looking for something that would encourage all of us, that it really is worth it to equip others for ministry that the impact of what we do reaches far beyond what we may see at the time. Well, I thought of an illustration. You've heard me speak many times of Dr. Howard Hendricks, and I want to put up on the board an illustration of how this law of equipping really works, that one person equips another and equips another, that the impact goes on for generations. But let's start. I was sitting one night at home wondering how I could kind of illustrate this whole concept, and I thought of Dr. Hendricks. Let's represent him right here. This is Dr. Hendricks. He was only obviously one of a bunch of teachers that I had, but he had a tremendous impact upon my life. And he taught literally hundreds of men and women over the years. In fact, I think it's really more like thousands. And each one of them has a story, but I only know one of the stories. That's the story about me. Let's say this is me right here. This is Bruce. And this is Howard Hendricks. Well, in time, God began to move in my heart, and we started an organization called Walk Through the Bible. And if, if for the first few months, I was the only one teaching these seminars, and then because there were so many requests, I started training some of my friends. At, at that time, training was just come follow me, watch me give the seminar, and then you're on your own. You teach it next week. And in time, we realized that uh, that's not a really an effective way to equip others for ministry, if you know what I mean. Well, I trained a number of men myself. And finally, this one right here, Art Vanderveen, turned out to be a tremendous teacher. In fact, he was really a tremendous coach. And I said to Art one day, I said, Art, why don't you become the trainer for Walk Through the Bible Ministry? So we spent some time together. And in time, over the years, Art Vanderveen trained a whole lot of different people. A lot of them. And one of the men that he trained is this man right here. This is John. And John was given the task of being our vice president of international. And he took the ministry literally around the world. Well, the first place John Hoover took Walk Through the Bible, besides the United States, was down under. He took it down to Australia. And John came down, and he trained a number of different men in Australia. And one of the men that he trained was a man by the name of Gary Coleman, right here. And then Gary went out, and he began to train people in Philippines. Australia became a sending place for Walk Through the Bible. 